Okay, well, good evening and welcome to Connected by Glass. I'm Amy Schwartz, I'm the director of the studio. Uh, the Connected by Glass series features museum experts and special guests who share their insights into a range of topics, allowing us to discover all the unexpected ways that we are connected by glass. Tonight, we are fortunate to hear from artist and Fulbright scholar, Dr. Carlin Sutherland. Originally trained as an architect, Carlin describes her work in glass as an investigation into the attachments people form to place. It's an honor that she chose the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass to explore this compelling body of work. Carlin first visited us in Corning in March of 2017, in the before times, as an artist in resident at the studio, I was taken by her artwork that explored the transmission, reflection, and reflect refraction of natural light. I was equally impressed by her creative process, the diligent research-driven exploration of mirrored glass. At that time, Carlin's work had already caught the attention of curator Susie Silbert, and later in 2017, Carlin became the recipient of our museum's 32nd Raykow Commission. This prestigious annual award is often given to an emerging artist in support of the development of new works of art in glass. And the resulting piece, Harbor Road Leibster, was accessioned into the museum's permanent collection and can be seen in the Contemporary Art and Design Gallery. In 2018, Carlin asked for our support as she prepared an application for a Fulbright scholarship. The Fulbright program is the United States government's flagship program of international education and cultural exchange. It offers passionate and accomplished individuals the opportunity to study, teach, conduct research, exchange ideas, and contribute to mutual understanding. Fulbright scholars inspire, innovate, and contribute to finding solutions to challenges facing our communities and our world. Carlin proposed a 12-month research project where she might use the resources of the museum, the Ray Cal Library, and expert staff while renting time for practice-based research at the studio. Carlin's grant was initially awarded for 2020, and COVID presented a major disruption. We were lucky to welcome her in August of 2021. Over the past several years that I have known Carlin, it has been a pleasure to see her be so open to opportunities and to see her grow and develop. She has maneuvered successfully through the challenges of our environment as it was impacted by COVID, and she has taken full advantage of the resources that are available to her and become a part of our local glass community. This Fulbright residency has culminated in a solo exhibition called Articulated At Atmospheres at the Heller Gallery in New York, which is on display through July 15th. Fulbright scholars build their skills and connections, gain valuable insights, and return home to share their experiences with their colleagues. I have every confidence that Carlin will share her knowledge and that others will benefit from her experiences here. I know you've joined me in my excitement to hear her speak tonight, so please welcome Dr. Carlin Sutherland. Hello. Um, thank you, Amy, for um, that introduction. Um, so, I'm going to talk about my work, my more recent work, the last five years, in kind of three chunks. But first, before that, I'll give you a very brief overview of my own background. But I wanted to start really by issuing a round of thanks to Amy, to Harry and Stephen and the rest of the studio staff who have accommodated me in what has not been an easy time for anybody, but always you know, made space for me when it probably wasn't the easiest to accommodate an extra person in amongst such a busy schedule, and to always be on hand for problem solving, cups of coffee, cookies, you know, just general, general chatter. It's not I really underestimated how difficult it would be actually to get back into the swing of traveling and changing countries. I thought I would kind of slip back into it. Um, but the camaraderie uh, and the support in the studio really made that, you know, a lot easier. So thank you very much. Um, so actually, I applied for a Fulbright three times 
and I was obviously not successful the first twice. The, <laughs> the first time I was underprepared, I didn't really, like I knew how important, I mean I'd written this big application and the whole process is very drawn out and you know it's long, you know you submit the applications in by November, you write this 4,000 word proposal, you get your referees, you get all your ducks in a row. If you interview is February, you get you know your rejection or your acceptance in March. So it's a long cycle. The first time I interviewed and I just was too nervous, too underprepared, and I knew straight away and I thought, okay, this is a learning experience, it's fine. And the second time, I thought, okay, I'm really like I was as prepared, I think, as a person could be. And I felt that, I really felt I'd nailed it. So I thought, if, I, if it's gonna happen, this is it. And so in March, thanks, but we're sorry. So the next year, and I thought, I wasn't, I didn't really intend necessarily to apply again. And I thought maybe it's just one of those things that is beyond my capabilities, which is fine. Cause I think for me, like I, it's quite healthy to know the parameters of what you're capable of professionally. But I thought, you know what, actually I do want to give this one more go. So I remember writing to Amy and saying, you know, are you up for this again? So she said, sure, go for it. So I did that, I got my third interview and I turned up. So the first twice I'd interviewed in Edinburgh and it's in, the interviews are held in the Royal Society of Edinburgh, so it's a massive board table. People are very far away. And to, you know, I, was sh I had some printed out materials from a portfolio and you had to really push it across so that they could reach it. And the third time I interviewed in London and it was a very shallow desk and I could see comb marks in the hair. In the hair of, they, they always make up the panel with, you know, there's the Fulbright commissioners, there's members of staff and they fly in somebody from, you know, an external consultant from the US. And we're sitting there and when I sat down, this woman who had been at the previous two interviews said, it's good to see you again. And she meant it well, but I thought, yeah, yeah, we all know that this is my third time, you know? Um, and I, I shouldn't have let it knock me because she didn't mean it in a, you know, in a harmful way. But then you get three minutes to talk about your proposal. And I, bear in mind that this has been, like, you know, my research has been rolling since 2009. So it's kind of like knowing my own name. I just floundered. And I had, you know, I had notes, which I didn't, I don't usually take notes to an inter interview, but you're allowed to, so I had these bullet points and I apologized and composed myself and got on with it. But I thought, that's it, you know, it's not, because they look for people who are really on their game and I didn't feel that I was. So after maybe 10 minutes, this gentleman whose pores I could see and whose comb marks I could see in his hair said, what do you, can you tell me about what you do when you're not working? And my first thought was, was, I don't know that this man has ever been a self-employed artist because I don't think I really do anything else apart from working. Um, but really, they're looking for somebody who is an ambassador for their country, for the Fulbright program. And the other thing about these interviews is that you don't, you know, monosyllabic answers are not, you know, you really have to expand upon what you're saying. And I'm not the sort of person who usually says something without really thinking it through. But I heard myself say, I like to eat. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> which by the way is completely true, but I just thought, really? <laughs> so I thought for sure, I was like, well, that's the nail in the coffin, you know, but actually I relaxed so much more. And I think I was already relaxed because I was sure that I hadn't got it. But he wouldn't stop coming back to that. So we spoke probably more about food and eating and, you know, what I'd eaten in Corning when I'd been here before and, you know, all of that. So I left there and I thought, okay, this you know, third time is not a charm. But it, eventually, you know, it did turn out that it was. I was very surprised. And I don't know whether, you know, my openness about liking to eat really helped, but I like to think that my candor was appreciated. Um, so anyway, um, in July of last year, you know, the, the height of the Delta wave in the UK, I still didn't know really, if I couldn't really ever feel like this was going to happen. So I ran the gauntlet, so I live in the North Highlands of Scotland, I ran the gauntlet to London for a visa interview and back. Everything was clear, that got through. Delta cases at an all time high. So I'm having to get to London to fly out. And my parents, who are not going to appreciate me including this, but this is um, at the railway station in Inverness in the middle of July. And it, you can't really 
tell particularly there, but it is hammering rain. It's so wet. Um, and I'm getting on the Caledonian sleeper to go to London. And I don't know if any of you have ever been on a sleeper train or on the Caledonian sleeper, but there is, it's pretty tight. So here's my two suitcases. And uh, I still had to have, at this point, a negative COVID test before I could fly. So it was still, you know, this is why I didn't fly down to London. And so I thought, OK, the bar car is not open. There was no socialising, so I'm stuck in this room. There's a knock on the door, would you like a drink? And I thought, yeah, OK, sure, I think I probably would like a drink. And I was delivered in a brown paper bag a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> no glass, but you know, a bottle of whiskey. I'm, I'm going to get in bed because I've got so much luggage and I can't sit up because I'm tall and this bung is. And I don't usually drink in bed. I don't usually drink out of the bottle in bed either. <laughs> But it felt like the thing to do. So I'm bolstered in with my suitcases. And we're a couple of hours out of Edinburgh, out of in Inverness on the way down towards Edinburgh. And all of a sudden, the train comes to, like, there's a metal on metal screeching sound. And the train comes to a really sudden stop. And there's no reception, no cell reception at all. And so eventually, we get going. And it turns out what happens, what I learned in the morning, was that there'd been so much rain that there had been a landslide on the track. And the train had hit the landslide and the driver actually had the foresight to be going slow and we, you know, nobody was injured or anything, but I thought, really, I'm never, I'm never going to get to America. Anyway, here I am. Um, so I'm going to, I'll talk a little bit about where I'm from. This, uh, the red pin on the map is um, Leibster, the village that I'm from, and the northeast highlands of Scotland. Um, it's a small place. Um, it's where my father's family are from. He was born and grew up there. I grew up there and I lived there until I was about 18 when I went to college. Um, and I also, I found myself back there for a few years whilst I was finishing my PhD, which is not, I didn't ever expect I would be back in Leibster. And Leibster is also home to Northland's uh, Creative Glass, now known, as, uh, now known as Northland's Creative. And so I was studying architecture in Edinburgh, and I came to the end of my master's in 2008, which was when the recession was really just starting to hit, and there were no jobs. And I got the chance of a research scholarship, and further I studied for six years. Further study was not on my radar, but you know I'm a pretty enthusiastic student, and they're going to pay me to go to school, and I could do whatever I wanted. So I said, sure. Um, and I didn't know, actually, that that would turn into a PhD at that point. But my master's had been, I'd really focused on environmental psychology and in the phenomenon of place and attachment to place. So I'm interested, and this is something that is still carrying through in my work, I'm interested in what brings people back to place and how people form attachments and what is it about places, the built environment that really lodges itself in your memory and like, you know, f helps to facilitate these attachments. Um, and I also think that architects could understand that better or more. Um, so when I'm reading all of this literature, it's talking about people's relationships with home. So I'm thinking about my relationship with home. And when I left Leibster to go to college, I was like, okay, I'll see you later. No intentions of going back. Um, but I'd read, I, went, I remember, like I'd worked in the local hotel over many summers and Northlands would have their annual conference um, and series of master classes. So I saw a lot of faces coming through and you get to see the same faces coming back time and again. And I didn't know them, but I went and dug a bit deeper. And I read something that Dan Klein, the late Dan Klein had written about how <laughs> Northlands and Leibster had been life changing for so many people. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so I went, I thought, oh, I'll apply to take a class just to see and I didn't really go there with the intent of learning myself. I wanted to see what other people were responding to. Um, and obviously, we know really how that panned out. Um, so this is me, me in Edinburgh. And it turned out there was six more years' worth of study ahead of me. So my PhD was practice-based. Um, but my practice, in the end, actually was a body of work in glass, um, which was kind of was unexpected. So I graduated in. 2014 and have just been able, we've been really fortunate that I've been able to keep it going, to keep working, to be able to travel, to, you know, to be part of the glass community has been such a rewarding thing. 
So, I'm going to talk about my work, like I said, in three parts. Uh, and it's kind of, it's vaguely chronological, but I felt it was the easiest way to kind of break it down. So, the three parts are installations, perspective, and atmosphere. Um, so, installations. So, in 2016, I, and this was the first time really that I had been able to make something on an architectural scale, that, you know, an art piece. Everything I'd made between the first class I took at Northlands in 2009 and 2016 had been small scale, mostly sculptural. And this was the first opportunity. Um, so Lanny, and Dan, Lanny, McGregor and Dan Schwer, who own Bullseye Glass, also own this house in Latherin, which is four miles south of where I grew up. And so to the right-hand side of the White House, there's a low building, which is a barn or a buyer, as we know it in Caithness. And they were turning that into an exhibition space. Um, and there were four artists, four of us, and we were each given our own space. And I didn't really know what to do. So I would, you know, I just was living up the road at the time. So I'd go down and spend some time in the space. And they were only going to make it weatherproof. It was never going to be, you know, a white, a white box uh, gallery space. So as I would spend time there, I realized that, you know, I was watching these patterns of light and eventually I started to trace them. So any time I was in the space and the sun was out, I would trace it with chalk. And I kind of built up as the light moved around the space and I got to know the space a bit better. I got to thinking about the passage of time and how long this building had stood there for and what it had seen and the things that we don't know about, you know, the history of the, of the place, but also how, not that the sun always shines in Scotland, obviously, but that the same, you'd get the same cycle around the sun every year. So there were some things that were a constant. So I wanted to visualize these, you know, shafts of light. So I started to throw handfuls of flour into the air. So as it settles, the light, which, you know, these shafts of light, which are an intangible thing, become visible. And I have a video, I hope. So this is a couple of handfuls of flour inside a really fine mesh cloth. And the video is slowed down because I don't move very slowly. And so I decided that what I wanted to do was to make physical, in some form, slivers of these shafts of light. So I had measured the whole building and I had mapped out on my drawing where all these chalk marks were. And I lined up the roof lights and where the light was coming in and made this, this SketchUp model to try and figure out just the forms I was going to make. Um, and I really, I, like, I knew that these, if I hung them correctly, that these forms would be, could be illuminated by sunlight, by natural light once a year. So it was really kind of like a calendar. So I, and this was at, at Bullseye in Portland, I worked then to figure out the right kind of tack fusing temperature so that the white powder that I was throwing in the way that I was throwing the flower would tack fuse to the surface of the glass without, using any, without losing any opacity. And then I started to cut these forms, which were the, you know, come from the tracings that I had done of the shapes of light on the wall. And this is the installation. So there are five uh, glass forms in total. guiding you through the space down the one side of the building. And this is a gallery space, an exhibition space that's really in the middle of nowhere, so it's not open to the public. It's more, it's open by appointment. And I got to be there in the summer, because all of you know the time when the sun was out and I was doing all that tracing was in the summer. So I got to be there on the dates where 
you know, the dates and times where I had been there on years previous. And the show was up for two years, and both years, every single piece was illuminated by the sun, which is a rare thing in Scotland, obviously. Um, and I was the only person that got to see it, which actually was, was rather lovely. Um, and so the second installation, and this was part of what I was working on when I was here in 2017 as an artist in residence at the studio. Um, this is a part of this building is um, a former smokehouse on the edge of a river in Berrydale, which is further down the coast from Leipster. Um, and it's a really amazing space. It really, it, you can smell the smoke. You can't see very much because it's just illuminated by these roof lights. And you can hear the river, but you can't see it. And there had been a historic flood. And also, actually, I read today that it's been 50 years today since the flood in Corning, which is interesting to me. Anyway, there had also been a flood here and they had, similarly, a marker for where the level of the water had been. And I was really, I wanted to mark that date. So, I, I, you know, it's a similar process of tracing the light in the space as it moved. And then my time in the studio here was spent learn, I had never silvered glass before. So I had brought some of the river water with me because I wanted to make a site-specific mirror, if that was possible. And I had to convince my parents to send me bottles of river water <laughs> in the post. They're very tolerant. Um, so I made these mirrors. And you can see the, the sediment or whatever the reaction is between the chemicals and whatever is has obviously not been filtered out of the water. And then there's the pieces that are on the floor. And again, the sun came out when it needed to. So the sunlight is projected up into the, um, the roof of this space that had never been illuminated directly by sunlight before. And so my next section is perspective. And I've always had, you know, I, as you can imagine, a very keen interest in drafting and architectural drawing. Um, so after I, I, gra I graduated in 2014, and this was the first series of works I made after then. And I make work about my own experience. I, I suppose it's a way of processing, but it's also a way of relating what my research is about or what, you know, you know what form it's going to take or what direction it'll take. And a really good friend of mine had the year before, I think just in 2014, he had a kidney transplant and I had graduated, self-employed, so was, I drove him back and forth to his hospital appointments in our nearest city hospital, which is two hours away. So we spent a lot of time in these kind of white boxes, you know, up and down elevators and in corridors. Um, and what, what interests me about perspective and also about optical illusion, which follows later um, in a different way in my work, is that perspective drawing presents a false illusion. So it's not a viewpoint that can ever be attained. You'll never be able to stand somewhere and see everything, the, you know, everything converging like that. So in that, it creates a sense of disconnection, whether you're aware of it or not, between the viewer and the piece. So also between the architect and the drawing. So that, for me, was an interesting thing that I would never explore in architectural practice, but that I wanted to explore in my glasswork. And then in 2017, I spent a period of time um, out in Australia. I was um, an Endeavour Research Fellow out at the ANU when Richard Whiteley and Anne were still out there. Um, and I had in, I'd gone out to Australia with the intention of making some cast works, um, but the casting glass didn't arrive in time, so I had to make do with the sheet glass that was there. And I'd wanted to kind of cast these skewed perspectival forms. So I thought I'll try and do the same you know, for wall works and fused glass. So it's a f I think if that hadn't happened, if I was still casting, I think it would have had a very different trajectory, perhaps. Um, so it's interesting to think of those sliding doors moments. Um, so I also I made four works that were you know, of a much larger scale. These were all hand-cut fused glass. So I, t I take a drawing, I do a sketch, I then draw it on the computer because I need to know quite accurately what I'm going to cut and how much I can cut from a sheet of glass. And I break the drawing down into foreground, middle ground, and background. 
and then I fuse them all together. So this is, these perspective pieces are a translucent white, a black glass, and a white opal. So the gray line is actually black behind the translucent white. So that's the middle layer, just if that helps you understand how they're constructed. Um, so I made these works, and I was really excited, but I had a really hard time getting them seen or you know, in exhibitions, in publications, because everybody would write back saying, you can't just send in renderings, you know, it has to be photos of the real thing. I had submitted to New Glass Review for the first time with some of these works, and also some images from the installation um, in the barn in Latherin. And the installation got in, and these pieces didn't, and I thought, okay, it's another, another rejection on that front. And I came then, later that same year, I came to Corning um, for the residency and met Susie Silbert, who I hadn't actually met before, and she came straight over and said, tell me about whatever it was that you've sent in for New Glass Review, because we couldn't understand it. Um, anyway, during that time, during the residency, it was, um, was when she offered me the Rekha Commission, which considering I just, I, I still, it, it's really st still very hard to believe. It's a very surreal thing to see my work on the walls here. Um, yeah. I mean, this, when, she, when she offered it, I knew immediately that I wanted to make something that was about Leibstern. So, because, I mean, if I hadn't had that kind of interest in place or lived somewhere that had sparked such an interest in place and taken that class at Northlands, I would never have had the opportunities. And it's funny that such a tiny village in the middle of nowhere turned out to be, that I was so ready to leave, turned out to be a passport to the rest of the world in a funny way. So when I came back from Australia, this was prior to coming to Corning, I, and I actually had come back from Australia for what was my second failed Fulbright interview. Um, I think the jet lag might have been a contributing factor. Um, I had done the journey from Canberra and I'd gone back to my parents' house and I, did that whole journey in one go, and I woke up the next day and I was so kind of jet lagged, but just really out of sorts, um, and just felt really kind of disconnected. Um, so I made the piece about that, it was about returning home, and the sense of attachment, but also detachment from place. So, as ever, I started with a sketch and then began to kind of figure it out in, in AutoCAD and um, mapped out what the size the piece was going to be. And the beauty of the, or one of the, the beauties of the commission, commission was that it afforded me the opportunity to try something, a method of making that I hadn't before. So I was able to uh, hire a water jet cutter to make a much bigger work and to cut much more acute angles and thinner lines than what I had been able to do before. So. I modelled this piece on, it's an abstraction of two windows and a picture frame in the corner of my parents' living room in Leibster. So here's the setting out for the water jet cutting and some of that process. And then starting to assemble everything. And so you're seeing the front, the, the front face of this, um, this line, but that's actually six millimetres, so you know, maybe a quarter of an inch deep. So I was really able to make much finer, more um, detailed work in a lot of ways. And this is it being loaded into the kiln. And when I made it, I, so this was, you know, we fired it and I took it out and I, as soon as I lifted the pieces out of the kiln, I thought these are far too small. And I emailed Susie and I said, I think I have to make it again. So I did make it again. I made it a third bigger. Um, and this actually is, I wanted to touch on the, the, the surface treatment. All my work has the same surface treatment. Um, I like a really kind of matte finish. I really love the way that the light gets trapped in the glass. And I also, I don't think that reflective surface lends itself that well to, to my work. So this is a pretty typical uh, finish for me. And here's the piece in the museum. So it was a pretty nice moment to get to hang a piece of livestock on the wall in, in Corning, New York. And my parents were just here actually for the, the opening at Heller, and they came to Corning 
for the first time and were able to see it in situ, which was, which was a pretty nice moment. Um, so then the next perspective related project I did was in 2019 and it was the last thing I did before the pandemic really got going. Um, and so I'd made some table prototypes, not with line drawing, but with overlaying planes of color um, in 2018. Um, but I had the opportunity to go to um, Bullseye Glass in Portland to their research and education facility to not water jet cut, but so this is the machine in the background with the, um, the yellow housing and then the, the trunking that goes across the bed. They've, there's a glass cutting head in there and it's, you program in your computer drawing and the arm moves across the bed and the head scores the glass. So you're not cutting through it, but it allows, because it's an even pressure, it's hard to cut really acute angles by hand, um, but this machine made it so much easier. So this was my first foray into furniture prototypes. I made two tables. This is the same pair of tables, just photographed from a different angle. Um, and it's amazing to me the difference when you take the work off the wall and put it horizontally because you're able to walk around it. The perspective works in such a different way. And you end up with things that look like they shouldn't work. Um, so, atmospheres, which really is, I mean, it's all about atmospheres, but this, this body of work, and this really has been what mostly what I've been focusing on in my time here. So I, without any, any plan, have, and, you know, in hindsight, looking back, realized that I was really interested in windows, um, interested in how that, whether it's a barrier or an opening between the inside and outside, and how you know, that allows us a connection to the outside world, but also how the light that comes in really affects the atmosphere inside. So I was really interested in, in those relationships and a lot of the work I have made has been about windows. Um, and I'm also really influenced by Caithness, by the light in the place that I grew up. So this was taken at midnight on the solstice maybe four years ago. It's only like that if it's a cloudless sky, which, you know, not all that frequent. And I'm interested really in its everyday spaces. It's not, it's not really any you know, grand moments, it's just everyday occurrences. And I think that working in glass has made me a much sharper observer. And I think if I was to go back to practicing architecture, I think it would make me a different and hopefully a much better architect. So we live on the coast, so there's a lot of the, the light reflected in the sea. We don't get as much snow as what you get here, but um, when it lies, when the wind isn't from the sea and melting everything, we can get moments where we're snowed in. So after the, the Reiki Commission, and actually after part of what I'd been doing when I was here, um, the residency was looking at overlaying planes of color to get more or less saturation, depending on whether I was using something that was you know, translucent or semi-translucent. So this is how I started to build up these layers. Uh, this is a translucent white glass over various opaque colors. And I'm thinking about this window, how it opens, what the color of the sky is like outside when it's really windy and I was snowed in. So I'm starting to, instead of drawing by line, the perspective, I'm picking out the planes and trying to create that illusion of depth that way and just trying to evoke atmosphere, so trying to capture something of what I experienced, but also trying to communicate something of that. And obviously, everybody's always going to interpret that differently. Um, and then I make pieces about places, and they end up in other places, which is you know, another really interesting thing, how pieces take on, on life, um, depending on where they are. And in 2019, so before I went to Bullseye, actually, I'd been an artist in residence at Pilchuk. And I'd never been to Pilchuk before. And the Caithness Coast is quite barren. There's not a lot of trees. It's quite flat. Um, so, you know, to be there, you know, on the hill at Pilchuk in the fall with all these beautiful colors, 
So this picture is the bedroom window. And it has these uh, folding shutters that I would pull back every morning. And sometimes it would be misty. Sometimes, you know, as the, the leaves were changing and falling, there would be all these different colours. So I took a lot of photos. And I started a body of work. And a lot of these pieces, actually, I made during lockdown at home. I bought my first kiln. And I don't know what I'd been doing without a kiln before then, but I bought, bought my first kiln, and that's how I, how I kept myself busy. So the, this is a piece, and it's, it's quite a, a mustardy acid colour on the back, which is muted by opaline. Um, I started to work with opaline glass at Pilchuck because I felt there was a, it had a real ephemeral quality, and I could control the opacity by how hot or how long I fired it for. So I made a whole series of works about my time at Pilchuck. And so these works, all of these Pilchuck works are actually in the show um, at Heller. Um, and some of them, because I had, obviously we had no idea at that point what was going to come in 2020, I had finished up some pieces that I thought were just tests and I I sent them, I was in touch with Susie Silbert and I was like, you know, I'm going to come to Corning in February, March of 2020. Um, is there any chance, you know, would you be able to keep these in your loft? So I sent Susie maybe three or four good sized boxes which sat in Susie's loft for like two years. <laughs> so when I unpacked them, it was, um, it, was, it was a nice, you know, a nice thing to unpack. I'd also sent myself all sorts of tools and snacks and things that I thought I would need kind of three or four months later. So this really was the beginning of me starting to work with more boldly with color because I'd obviously had quite a monochromatic palette before then. And I'd made you know, the black and white works because they're about detachment from place. I deliberately, you know, they were devoid of, of color. Um, so these were really beginning, they felt quite loud for me, um, but just beginning to describe something in a new way. And then when I finally made it to Corning, um, again in August of last year, I started from where I'd left off at Pilchuck, and I started to make a really comprehensive set of temperature, uh, well, temperature tests really with opaline. So I was taking all of these colors, and this is, these shots are before firing and after, because a lot of, there's a lot of uh, striking glasses, the appearance changes with heat. So I made a lot of these samples, and what I was trying to do was just create a palette for myself, so that when I made work whilst I was here, but also in future, that I would have reference material for just how to kind of capture something uh, that is intangible, really. So you can start, to, you can see how these are stepped up with the layers of opaline, and it's a much lighter, um, the opaline is, is actually understruck in these, but I get a much bigger variance in color. And I started to lay these out, and I realized that well, something's not right here. And Harry will remember this fondly. Um, it turned out there was an element out on one side of the kiln. So these squares are opaline glass on top of black glass, and they were spread out all the way across the kiln bed there, as you can see on the shelves. And then when I brought them all together, you could see where the cold spot was in the kiln. So my samples were, I had no way of knowing really what they'd fired to. But actually, I think that this has been a catalyst for so much more. And I had the great opportunity to go to Sullivan Park yesterday, um, where I was speaking, well, I can't, it's speaking, it wasn't my idea, it was their idea, to deliberately induce this in a kiln, how to deliberately vary the temperature across the kiln to affect the glass. So I'm pretty sure that as soon as I am able, wherever that may be, to make work next, this is where I'll be setting off from. And so I knew, I, I know I had the show with Heller on the horizon and I started to try and make work, but I had I'd kind of struggled, you know, I had the Pilchuck experience and that kind of body of work, which has started rolling before the pandemic. I had that to rely on during lockdown, but I was really struggling just to really feel creative. And I know I wasn't alone in that because I think there's so much else that was going on in the world that, you know, it was really hard to, to focus and to, you know, to really 
just feel good about what you were doing. So I was taking photos of where I was staying. Um, and this was in the middle of the night. Um, I think there was like a thunderstorm and I took a long exposure. And this is just, there's a series of street lights outside um, the wall and just the way that the light is projected. So I started to make work because I thought I just, you know, I'd done all this testing. I thought I just have to rip the bandaid off and start making some bigger things and then it'll follow from there. So I made this piece. And also, it's hard. I, you know, in the pandemic, I thought I maybe need to not make work about myself anymore. It seemed in a, in a way very self-indulgent. And I, the thing that's always interested me about atmospheres and a sense of place is that everybody experiences them, but everybody experiences it differently. So I had put out an open call on social media and just asked if anybody was interested to share images of their own environments, because we were all in lockdown. And I got a wide range of responses, and I didn't know what I really was going to do with it. I had no intention of making work, but a couple of the images were so striking and just really beautiful that, and also the geometry, you know, I'm a big, you know, there's a lot of things that are quite obvious what they would appeal or why they would appeal to me. So this was the first image that I received, and it was from Judith Schechter. Um, and it's, you know, a bedroom in her house, and it was beautiful. So I sat with this image for a really long time, and eventually I made it work. And it felt really laboured, I think because I, I couldn't relate to that, like I didn't have the experience that she had standing there. So I could, you know, relate to the geometry and try to capture something, but it wasn't from lived experience. So I kind of pressed pause, and I looked at all these samples, and I was thinking about, I needed to make work that was simpler. And I think because everything else is so complex or has been so complex in the last two years, I just needed something that was maybe more still. So I started to make these gradations and I was cutting triangles of, uh, of opaque glass and then overlaying opaline over the top. These were small samples. And this was in January of this year. So I realized that this is really really was capturing something for me of what I was trying to do. So I started to make these much bigger. So they're all, it's three millimeter glass that's cut in strips and you can see that they're tapered. And then I cut the opaque glass over the top because I can't cut a long thin triangle. And this is what the opaline does to the black glass underneath. So I cut many strips. And then I revisited another series of images. So these were three separate images um, that uh, Nancy Nicholson had sent me in the same open, you know, open call that I'd put out. And I am not a pink person, but I loved these. I loved that it looked like there were flying saucers in her house. <laughs> and also just the hot pink frame, and it was just really different to everything else I'd been sent. Um, so I did the same with the gradations, uh, the gradation of the opaline over what is actually a really bright red. Um, I'm very successful at making work that's really hard to photograph, so this is actually much better in person, in my opinion. Um, but there is, between the left-hand panel and the right, there's only nine degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Celsius difference in top temperature. So it's not a lot. The variance is really small. Um, so that's really interesting to me, just, just how wide a palette I'll, I'm able to have. Um, so I'm going to close by showing some installation shots from the show at Heller Gallery. And Katja and I first had a conversation about this show at SOFA 2019, so as well as thinking maybe I was never gonna get to come here as a Fulbright Scholar, I also didn't really, couldn't ever really believe that this was going to happen at Heller. I'm very pleased that both have happened.
that is all. Thank you very much. Well, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So um, Harry's on this side with the microphone, and Megan's on that side with the microphone. So if anybody has a question, you can wait till one of them gets to you so everybody can hear your question. And since we went to the trouble of getting two microphones, we have to have a question. We have to have two questions. There's one. Claire. Hey. Um, I know that you took a class in color theory at the beginning of your research. Do you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I took um, I took a few, like a few on cl online classes, like a lot of people during uh, the pandemic. But when I arrived here, knowing that I was going to work, I wanted to work a lot more with color. I took an online uh, class through Parsons, um, which had so I had painting homework every week for for ten weeks, which and it was a really it was a really interesting thing, I think, in terms of learning how to pair colours together particularly. And that's not something that I have done yet, although it is something that is on the horizon, I think. I, um, there are so many, I mean, you'll see from like the samples that I had laid out that there's such a wide array of colour there that it's, it's very hard to, to kind of pair them up. And also because I, you know, I need more time, I think, to temperature test things too, and often, you can, I can make these really small samples and they look like one thing and then I make them in a bigger panel and it's completely different, especially once it's cold direct. So um, yeah, there's more to come on that, I think, for sure. Good question. Thank you very much. Thank you. You showed us many pictures mm -hmm. uh, of, like, there were clouds and frost coming through windows from sunlight and then some were indoors under fluorescent lights I mean, I was just trying to think of how the, the temperature or color of the light affects your work and whether you've gotten involved with manipulating the light. Um, it does. It does really affect it. Um, I, haven't, I haven't got involved in manipulating it. I think that it's... I mean, there's a big difference. I mean, you were here when I took some of those pieces out of the kiln, and because of the, it looks also they're in shadow, so they can appear much darker. And then when I hold the opaline up to the, you know, near a window, near natural light, it takes a completely different kind of hue. And I think that I don't mind that. I don't really feel like I need to send the work out under and to, for it to be lit under particular conditions. Like I quite enjoy the fact that it changes, especially if it changes through you know natural light when it's hanging in a gallery or you know in somebody's home like I like that it, there is it's not just like a static thing I think but yeah it is and lighting actually as a separate thing is something that I would be interested to to look more into generally so you move from white and black to now color. Do you visualize yourself ever moving into th three-dimensional and uh, rather than just things on the wall in the future with your work? Yeah, I would really like to. You know, and when I, when I went out to Australia, first of all, it was, was with the intention of casting and these, uh, and they were, they'd come from perspective drawing, so they were more, much more um, Escher-like than, you know, the work is now. But I, I wanted to make them, and I was very naive because I'd, I hadn't trained in glass, so I thought if I can make a model of this, and I, I knew that I could probably burn out the, you know, the cardboard model in the, in, uh, in the investment mixture and then fire it. So I thought it wasn't going to be too big a deal to cast something that was pretty big. Um, it's obviously very wrong. Um, but I would like to, to go back to that. I would like to revisit it. And I would like to experiment more with, with wall-hung work too, not just with sculpture that is not, has not got a completely flat surface. One more. Sorry. Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, after the Rakow Commission, when you did the water jet cutting, did you go back to that at any point, or has that come in and out of your practice in terms of finished pieces? Obviously, some of the stuff you're cutting on your own, and then maybe yeah. like part two to that, if that 
affects the way you think about the work because obviously you're mostly a maker and having someone else do a lot of the like mechanical cutting might affect that. So just wondering. Yeah, that's a good question. And I actually didn't, um, I should have mentioned that, that for the most part, I cut everything by hand. So the commission was the first thing that I water jet cut and then the tables were cut by machine and then the black and white works that I have in the show at Heller were also water jet cut. Everything else is cut by hand, but I do, it's interesting because I, I don't want to overuse technology. I don't want to use it where I could be doing something by hand. Um, but I think because, especially for the tables and things that are more design led and are less about my own personal artwork, um, I have a different relationship to it where I think I would be okay with handing it over to somebody to cut and, and make. But I actually really enjoy, I mean, if I could cut them by hand, I would still do it. Um, but yeah, I much, you know, I enjoy being kind of hands-on and doing it, but and just, it's nice to have it there as a tool, but I don't, it's also really expensive. So it has, you know, for the right opportunity, I'll use it, but yeah. Hi, Carl. Hello. Um, actually, Jim's question got me thinking about, um, and thinking about multiple extra dimensions to your work. Um, have you looked at, as you hold up these samples and you look at them in reflection, what about transmission? I mean, you, you, you're, you're inspired by windows. Would you make windows? Yeah, well, I think I would need to be making uh, work panels that were a lot thinner. <laughs> Those gradation pieces are about an inch thick, um, so they're pretty heavy. Um, yeah, I would, definitely. And actually, I know, like I said, I was at Sullivan Park yesterday, and that was, you know, I mean, I'm never going to have a vacuum former in my studio, but to be, you know, to start to see the possibilities of things that are being developed for films, for windows, you know, I, was how say, I, I know somebody who makes thin glass. That's yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's different ways of getting gradations um, and achieving the same thing, hopefully, I mean, I'd love to realize something like that as like an installation or part of an architectural fabric rather than just something that was solely art. So yeah, if anybody, you know, if anybody fancied it. <laughs> Have you thought about playing with photochromic glasses and how they interact with light? Yeah, I mean, I to be quite honest, all of my work I have made to date, with the exception of uh, the glass that was silvered, which was window glass, um, I've used bullseye glass pretty exclusively because they had just, I, I learned mostly, I did a couple of classes, but I mostly just learned through their educational materials online. Um, so I feel like I'm at just the very beginning of exploring the material, um, but I am, yeah. I've, there's there's a lot. I've got a long list of things to to fuel me going forward, but that definitely is one of them. Yeah. That seems like a good note to mm -hmm. end on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlin. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.